Hi, I'm Bob Royer and welcome to NetLine, City Light's online video version of its successful employee outreach newsletter, Network. The follow-up to our employee opinion survey noted that a lot of people felt that they didn't know what their colleagues at work did. We thought this would be another way of describing what people across the utility do to provide reliable power to our customers. Every two months, NetLine will be distributed on DVD, CD-ROM, and over the internet as streaming video, with an entertaining look at the different craft skills and expertise being performed by City Light workers. In this first edition, we'll travel up to the Ross Powerhouse and watch as the workers finish up an ongoing rewind of Unit 42's generator assembly. Then we'll take a look at the art of pole climbing, how our line workers learn to safely work high above the ground while dealing with high voltage, something you'll never see in the circus. Finally, we'll take a look at our first generating station 100 years after it first generated electricity. So we hope you'll let us know what you think about our little experiment here. Write me an email or give me a call. My email is bob.royer at seattle.gov and my direct phone line is 615-0050. We hope you enjoy the show. It's not something one sees every day. A ballet of sorts with Skagit machinist Rob Lewis acting as conductor directing individual members of the orchestra made up of Skagit electrician constructors, machinists, and dam operators, all working together to support the movement of the prima ballerina. In this case, a hefty 530-ton mass of iron and steel that makes up the rotor assembly of Ross Powerhouse Generating Unit number 42. That's over one million pounds. And as with a ballerina, the movement must be intricate, delicate and exact, with less than an inch of clearance in some cases, as the rotor is lowered into a hole 28 feet in diameter. Of course, the rotor can't move by itself, but needs the assistance of two cranes and three connecting hooks. Uh, we're working in three dimensions when we're doing this. Uh, we're positioning and centering and dropping down with the three 170 ton hooks. So when we're done, it's got to set on the working station blocks in a almost true position such that everything else will register up correctly. This is at the end of the refurbishment. The delicate dance was already performed once before when the rotor was pulled out of the generator. Tearing down the machine took a couple months. Julie Knopf is an electrician constructor. She has been working on the rebuild with other city light workers and the specialized outside contractor since April 2004. It's a major job. We're rebuilding the inside of the generator, they're restacking the iron and we're getting all new coils, which is how they produce the electricity. Unit 42 was put in place at the Skagit Hydroelectric Project's Ross Dam back in the early 1950s. Ross is the third and largest dam in a series of dams on the upper Skagit River, about 120 miles northeast of Seattle. Unit 42 is one of four generators at the Ross Powerhouse, and taking one of these big machines apart means a lot of coordination. Many different crafts and skills are needed to get the job done. While this is the first time this type of rewind has been done, it's not the first time one of the Ross units has had its rotor removed. Probably on average every 10 to 15 years one would need to be pulled apart. Orrin Wilson, Ross Generation Supervisor, says it's all part of keeping the machines reliable. We went through some rebuilds in the 90s where they replaced runners on some equipment and did upgrades to others. Runners are the uh, turbine part. And then they went through and just cleaned things up and checked them out. And based on those inspections is where they made some determination to make, uh, to do this generator rewind. As you probably remember from your grade school science class, electricity can be generated by spinning magnets near a conductor, like a loop of copper wire. In this case, it's tons of iron, magnetized with electricity rotated at 150 revolutions per minute by the tons of water rushing past the turbine blades and the loops of copper wire are intertwined with each other to create a stator which surrounds the rotor and is where the electricity for use is actually generated. There are incredible forces being controlled here by human and machine. There are many challenges taking apart one of these old generators other than just the dealing with the massive size and weight and the confining space inside the powerhouse. Ross Dam is remote at the very end of a lake with steep canyon walls on either side. Everything that came, comes in is barged in and everything that goes out is barged out. 
rebuild itself, the generator rewinding was the parts were removed by a contractor, shipped back to their home plants and where the parts were refurbished there. While that happened, the rotor was bolted to the powerhouse floor and the crews of the contractor, Voigt Siemens, reinstalled the rebuilt parts of the generator and city light workers went about the work of keeping the other three units working normally, providing power to Seattle. Generator 42 was the first of the four generators to be rewound. It's had problems for several years, which have kept it from performing at its peak efficiency. Before the rewind on this generator, we were only at 80%, so we can only generate 80 megawatts out of this generator, and when they're all done, it'll be 125, it'll be rated for 125 megawatts. Back to the ballet, this same performance will be conducted on the remaining three generators through the end of the decade. I'm Peter Clark for Seattle City Light. City Lights line workers do a tough, dangerous job that takes teamwork, tenacity, and training. All three are needed to overcome common fears about working around electricity high above the ground. This elite group of professionals logs more than 500 hours of class time and 8,000 hours of field experience in City Lights apprentice program. And much of that field work is suspended 50 plus feet in the air. The apprenticeship program takes four full years to complete. To get in, candidates must first pass a rigorous six-month pre-apprenticeship course. Take another one. Oh, man, it's not coming, man. It's com oh. take, take, take another one. Take another one. It's similar to a boot camp, uh, not quite as rigorous, but there's strength training involved, uh, three, uh, 12 hours a week. Uh, there's climbing involved, uh, four hours a week for the first five months. Uh, they work on a crew for um, um, 24 hours a week. So yeah, it's they're learning the rudiments of the trade and they're becoming acclimated to the craft. Pre-apprentices practice pole climbing low to the ground. Before working over 50 feet in the air, they must first conquer their fears and learn to work their way around a pole using only their feet and safety belts. Veteran instructors show them the way. Like if you're gonna adjust, right like that. Now look at, no, 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 get that waist out. Okay, uh, what, what, what's the first problem you got going on there? What's the law? Uh, nothing. That's the first problem. Okay. Okay, second problem. Get one of them legs to load the other. The apprentice program attracts people of varying ages and backgrounds. Although most are males, more than 100 women have been recruited and trained to be line workers. The job requires tremendous upper body strength. If they pass all their tests, candidates can enter the four-year apprentice program. They'll spend the next four years learning every aspect of pole work, including how to help someone who comes in contact with a power line and loses consciousness. You'll be all right, buddy. Don't you worry. You need to get home to see your wife and kids. Hang in there. Apprentices working with journey line workers simulate rescue missions using a dummy victim. Line workers use long fiberglass tools called hot sticks to de-energize the power line. Only then is it safe to make contact with the victim and lower him to the ground. The fast counts, but you do not want to become a second victim. So each rescue team has to assess the situation not to become the second victim, and they also have to assess the situation and protect the public. Jay, you know CPR? CPR and good teamwork can make the difference between life and death. Knowledge, skills, and safety, they put it all on the line for you, the citizen owners of Seattle City Light. I'm Eric Polson for Seattle City Light. Behind me is Masonry Reservoir and Chester Morris Lake, and they feed the Cedar Falls Hydroelectric Project. Now, this was all built back in the early 1900s because of a devastating fire that nearly wiped Seattle right off the face of the map. 
You might even say that Seattle City Light was built from the ashes of that great fire back in 1889. The Seattle Fire of 1889 was so large it nearly leveled the young city of Seattle. A burgeoning town built primarily of wood, the fast-moving inferno put the city's firefighters to the test. But they lacked one key thing, good water pressure. As the smoke cleared, the city's forefathers headed into the mountains to solve that problem. Ralph Ness, an educator with Seattle Public Utilities, says this is what they were thinking. There's this natural lake up in the mountains called Cedar Lake. It has fantastic water. It just has great clean water, and we know that because we've been kind of looking around thinking about this even before the fire. So why don't we go ahead and let's build a municipal water system and pressurize everything so that we don't have to do this all over again the next time we get a big fire. So in 1891, the city issued its first bonds and began buying up land in the Cedar River watershed. But there was a catch. The city, a small city of Seattle, very kind of poor and struggling, could not afford to buy the timber and the land. So what the city's plan was is over the years, they were going to allow private timber companies in particular, who owned most of the land, to log the land off and then acquire the land, which was much cheaper. And I'll give you an example. I was looking at an old map the other day. One square section of land, uh, the value of the timber on the land was about $10,000. The value of the land without the timber was about $250. The city of Seattle began building its water supply facility, but not on the lush land you see today. No, much of it was barren and logged off. The old growth forests, gone. The water supply came online in 1901. The power supply came online in 1904. So it was sort of a one-two. And at the time, the whole structure was called Seattle, uh, City of Seattle Light and Water Department. So they were combined, they were together, and people saw the benefits of being able to control the water and using it for power. The public benefits were huge, according to safety engineer Tej Matur. Customers no longer were being gouged by private companies and began paying less for power. They were the first municipal corporation to get into that business and uh, produce power and brought down the rate uh, from 20 cents to about 8.5 cents a kilowatt hour. And Seattle now had a plentiful drinking water supply with ample water pressure. Mature says the Cedar Falls project was so important it recently earned historic landmark recognition. The water department became Seattle Public Utilities and they still look after the water supply. The light department became Seattle City Light. The Cedar Falls Dam facility Seattle City Light runs was the first hydro project the city ever built. It's celebrating 100 years of generating clean power this year. It's 100 years of a publicly owned utility. A lot of heritage there, a lot of generations of workers in the city of Seattle and the outlying areas. Tim Noonan is an electrician constructor at the Cedar Falls Dam and says at the turn of the century it looked nothing like the concrete dam of today. Cedar Falls was first a crib dam, a more crude structure built from logs and rocks that did hold back some water but not very efficiently. As the city's energy needs increased, the crib dam was raised six feet to hold back more water. And a few years later, the city made a big commitment. They decided to build a concrete dam to replace the crib. Undertaking a project this large was, was pretty monumental. Building the masonry dam, for example, just after the turn of the century. Uh, pouring that much concrete, I believe it was the largest concrete structure in the world at the time. The manpower, it was just phenomenal. The city built the company town of Cedar Falls to house the workers it would take to complete this huge structure. There was a whole community of City Light employees out here. Actually, they had camps up in the watershed near the lake where they had employees living while they were building the facilities. But power generation came at a cost. The region lost the town of Moncton. It now lies below the waters of Rattlesnake Lake. The town really developed around the railroad. This was a railroad line that went through here, and 
There were about 30 houses and a hotel, a grocery store. As workers raised the waters behind the masonry dam, the townsfolk of Moncton noticed something peculiar. As they started to fill up that dam, uh, all of a sudden, uh, down in this town, water started bubbling up from underground. And the people who lived in the town, you know, kind of came out and they're like, well, you know what? Well, it's, you know, that's kind of kind of strange. I wonder where this water's coming from. Well, you know, they didn't worry about it too much. They went back into their houses. They got up the next morning and the water had risen up six more inches and kind of spread out through the middle of town. And the wooden sidewalks that they had in town were now floating on water. And eventually it lifted their houses off of their foundations. And what we had was a lake filled with houses floating around. Well, at this point, the city of Seattle figured out what was going on. And what was happening was the water from behind the dam was seeping through this glacial moraine, which is just like a big pile of sand and gravel. This was the birth of Rattlesnake Lake and the death of the town of Moncton. The city said to the people who lived there, hey, look, we're really sorry about this, but, you know, I mean, who knew? So um, we'll pay you for your houses and your property, and you can go live somewhere else. So they did. The town of Moncton ceased to exist. But the city did lower the dam's reservoir and allow the townspeople to salvage some houses and other belongings. Meanwhile, Cedar Falls grew into a bustling town. Today, it's like stepping back in time. This is one of the few places the five globe lamps that once lit up the streets of Seattle still shine. Unfortunately, because of 9-11 security concerns and technology advancements, this old company town no longer has residents and is now closed to the public. But years ago, that was not the case. My first visit to Cedar Falls was in 1974, and there was a whole community up here where you drove out a road in the middle of nowhere, and at the end of the road you came to, to sidewalks and manicured lawns and a whole community with a pool and a gymnasium, a school, a post office, and a, a train depot, and a lot of working activity. As the town of Cedar Falls grew, so did the power project. The equipment that was here originally has been replaced with larger generators. The original generators were small 5 megawatt units. Now we have two 15 megawatt generators producing a total of 30 megawatt output. The larger generators were installed in the 20s, and as these photos show, not much has changed over the last 80 years. The powerhouse still uses much of the original equipment, although the staff now employs a few cats for rodent control, like Tiger. But time still moves slowly here. The powerhouse windows still have blackout paint from World War II. We've done a lot of improvements to upgrade the equipment over the years to provide better control of the, of the river flow. And our main objective there is to safeguard the salmon beds. Saving salmon and not cutting down trees is now the city of Seattle's objective. It took over 100 years for the city to buy up the land in the Cedar River watershed and halt the commercial logging. The watershed is nearly twice the size of Seattle now, and the old logging roads here are being removed to further enrich water quality. The city also forged a 50-year habitat conservation plan that guarantees water flows for salmon. The big focus on this whole project was to put controls in place for water flow that if we do trip offline and a machine is shut down, that we don't chop off the flow to the river suddenly. The Cedar Falls Hydro Project contributes just a small portion of Seattle's power needs today. The Skagit River Power Project and Boundary Dam provide the vast majority. Yet the Cedar River not only lights up Seattle, it provides residents some of the best drinking water in the country and incredible public access areas. There's even a public education center where you can learn all you'd ever want to know about the Cedar River watershed. Well, if you like to bike or hike, boat, or even picnic, then the Rattlesnake Recreation Area is not to be missed. As we told you, Rattlesnake Lake is a byproduct of the Cedar Falls hydroelectric project. And don't let that name scare you off. The name Rattlesnake comes from a local grass that grows here, and not a reptile. It's a great place to get out 30 minutes from Seattle to get out and sort of get away without having to drive all the way over the pass or all the way, you know, into the mountains.